Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Conversations with Tyler. Today, I am very honored to be here with Brian Armstrong, who is the CEO and co-founder of Coinbase. Brian, welcome. Thank you, Tyler. I appreciate it. Now, on another podcast, you said that Coinbase employs about 60 or 70 lawyers. What makes a manager good at managing lawyers in particular? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure if it's too different from general management of people. I think um, you have to care about them and care about their growth and give them clear direction, but also autonomy and accountability and all those things. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what is too different about managing lawyers. I think they're, they're people just like everybody else. But there's a kind of tech caricature of, say, companies in the Northeast that end up being run by their lawyers. And you have a company with a lot of lawyers but it seems you haven't ended up being run by your lawyers. Yes, well, that's definitely true as a cultural thing. I would agree with that. Um, yeah, there's, there is really there's something really important. I almost You want the engineers to outnumber the lawyers. Um, one of the metrics that we track inside the company is the percentage of engineering. And it, the trouble is if that falls too low, um, you start to have more people with ideas of what to do than people to actually go implement those ideas. And the engineers get frustrated, too, because there's just kind of just endless meetings about prioritization and um, rejiggering roadmaps instead of spending more of your time getting the actual things done. So I agree with that. You do need to have, a, you know, that that engineering culture. And we also we also have something that we say, which is that we're a product led organization. So the the product managers are considered the, the DRIs or the directly responsible individuals whose job is to go collect input from from legal, from finance, from engineering and they have to go render those final decisions so that the things can keep moving forward and we don't get bogged down in bureaucracy. Now, it, it seems to me that Coinbase has had fewer regulatory issues and problems than in many of its competitors. What have you done managerially to bring that about? Yeah, so again, I would say that's probably a cultural thing that came from the very early days of Coinbase and we've had to reinforce it and persist at every opportunity that we've gotten. So the, the thing that we did early on was that we decided we were gonna be uh, reaching out proactively to regulators, not waiting for them to come to us. And when we reached out to them proactively, we tried to be an educational resource and we tried to be um, basically legitimate. You know, we'd put on a suit and tie and we'd go in there and try to, you know, it, it's amazing how basically if somebody reads something on the internet, their default, in, you know, instinct is often like, this is something bad and what are they up to? But the minute they meet you in person, um, they immediately trust it more. And so, that education, advocacy, outreach um, sort of approach bought us a lot of goodwill along the way. And then it, that translated into a bunch of other things like we proactively went out and got licenses before it was even clear that we needed them. And we were we were essentially pushing the industry forward and saying, we think this should be a regulated, um, trusted industry. Otherwise, we felt like cryptocurrency was always going to be in the shadows or someone was going to try to shut it down. Now, you've described yourself as an introvert. Which personality traits do you have that make you so good at reaching out to regulators? That seems like a contradiction. Or is it that an introvert is better at doing that somehow? <laughs> well, in the early days of a company, I think, you know, as a founder, you do a lot of things that don't scale. So I was able to go reach out to some of those. Fred Urisum, who co-founded Coinbase with me, did a lot of it. Um, and he's probably more of an extrovert than I am. But over time, of course, your job is to not do everything yourself, but find the people who can go replicate that and do it even better than you can. And so... I'm kind of, I'm a master of nothing, but I, I can uh, dabble in almost any piece to fill in the gaps when the company is being built over time. If you were to explain to our listeners in 10 words or fewer, what is Coinbase? What's your answer? Um, let's see if I can do it in under 10 words. The primary financial account for the crypto economy. What is it that you know about how the company as a corporate form will change over the next 20 years? Because you work with crypto, a lot of which is very decentralized, but you're just a company, right? Run by people. In a sense, you're a regular company. So you straddle the two worlds. What do you understand that the rest of us don't? <laughs> well, I would hesitate to say that I know for sure anything that's going to happen in the next 20 years. But I'll tell you where I think the corporation could go. Or it's really, it may not even be a corporation in the traditional sense, but it's an organization, how people come together to get things done. Um, so one of the brilliant things that's been created in crypto is this idea of a smart contract. And it's instead of using lawyers to write on a piece of paper, a contract between people, you can essentially codify these, these principles in software, in code, and run it on a global decentralized blockchain, um, which is something that Ethereum allowed us to do, this idea of a smart contract. So that's kind of a, 
you know, nebulous idea, but what ended up happening in practice was um, people started creating these um, decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs, and um, it allowed people all over the world to kind of come uh, participate in, uh, in these groups. And they started doing, you know, this is all very early stage stuff, but they started, uh, for instance, raising money and then having voting proposals about how to allocate that money and all happening in a decentralized way. None of the participants even knew who the other people were in certain instances, or some of, in some cases they raised a billion dollars in 17 minutes from you know 20,000 people all over the world and they had never even met. And so these new kinds of things had, had come together. Some of them exploded, by the way, in spectacular fashion. Um, but it is creating a really new kind of governance uh, model out there. There's a, one of the organizations that I like that sort of has a good demo of this is um, it's called Aragon. And they've allowed anybody to kind of come in create one of these smart contracts in a very simple interface. Um, and, you know, you can you can set up the voting structure, the governance, how rewards might happen, um, how funds could be allocated. And it's it's almost like a new jurisdiction. You know, a lot of companies or corporations in the U.S. at least are incorporated in Delaware. Um, that's that's kind of the jurisdiction. It has a lot of case law around it. But you could almost think of these these DAOs as operating in sort of an, a new online jurisdiction um, that doesn't have a direct link to somewhere in the physical world. But there are, of course, real people in the real world all over the place interacting with them. So that's kind of interesting, exciting, and a lot of things could happen from that. But you don't run Coinbase that way, right? So why aren't you very skeptical of decentralized systems? You still have the Oracle problem, how to connect the smart contract to actual events in the world and who verifies what has happened. And then decentralized systems can be very slow to improve because no one owns the thing who can just come in and fix it just like the English language is a mess. So aren't you actually just a lover of more or less centralized systems and in your bones you're skeptical about decentralization? <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that. Um, I mean, when Coinbase started, of course, uh, Ethereum hadn't even been invented. So we started with the default path that was the best thing at that time. And I do think that um, decentralization is incredibly important. So obviously Coinbase is a centralized institution, but we're one of many uh, centralized institutions that are interacting with the decentralized crypto protocols, and so they're all and they all have some level of interoperability, right? So if you if you decide one day that you don't like Coinbase or they're doing something that um, is not in your interest, then you can send your cryptocurrency off of Coinbase, and it's fully compatible with any other uh, private company that might be interacting in that space. So there's certainly trade-offs to decentralization. You, you noted some of them, um, but I think it's uh, an important component that helps preserve a lot of the great properties that have made crypto successful and the internet and any other decentralized uh, organization. Now, why do companies have mission statements at all? So we would all agree, well, companies should stay within the law and then there's an obligation to maximize profits. So what extra is the mission statement adding? Or is that a kind of Straussian layering on top to make it all sound better. So when we say, oh, company should stick to its mission, what's wrong with just following the law and maximizing profits? Mm. It's an interesting philosophical question. So to me, the, the mission serves a different purpose. Um, let's just take for granted you're going to follow the law. Um, and what you're really doing with the mission is you're saying um, this company is aligned towards creating some good thing in the world. And that what that's it's it's important for a few reasons. One is that people don't want to work at a company that just is whose only goal is to make profit, right? I think profit is incredibly important. Don't get me wrong, but if that's the only thing that uh, people are joining for, it tends to be sort of like a soulless company or something like that. So it's it's a way, to, and it's also like a, it's a filter, I guess you could say. You want to make sure that people are coming into the company for the right reasons, because as you hire more and more people, you can't interview each of them yourself as the founder. So you have to put certain structure in place to make sure the people who are joining are all aligned towards some common vision of the world that you all want to create. And it creates that healthy that healthy culture and that selection of great people into the company. Um, along with the motivation. So I, those are my high level thoughts, I guess. But say someone came along and offered you, you know, a million bitcoins to breed green rabbits, and that would make the company a lot of money. It's probably not in your current mission statement, but at some margin you would consider doing it, right? So there's like a mission statement above the mission statement, or how does one think about that? Yeah, well, so there's this inherent tension, I think, in all companies, which is that um, you have this ultimate vision of the world that you want to see, but you also need to hire a bunch of people and make payroll every month. And the more people you can bring into the company to help you get there, get you there faster. So companies often have um, 
the thing that makes money and that's a, a step on the path to this longer term vision. So of course, Google makes most of their money from AdWords, which you know, selling ads is not like the sexiest mission in the world, but they obviously funnel the revenue from that into many world changing products or you know, um, Tesla, right? They, they wanna eliminate the world's dependence on fossil fuels, but they had to start by selling a car to rich people kind of to get the economies of scale working. So you often have, I, I would say that's somewhat true in our case for Coinbase as well, by the way, most of our revenue today we make from uh, trading fees. Um, and it's not like I'm super passionate about, um, you know, people investing in speculative assets or something like that, um, or trading just as a standalone business. I'm, I'm passionate about it because I want there to be more economic freedom in the world. And trading is one of those really important businesses. Um, we're making more of them with custody and all these other things. So those are the things that are helping us get the thousands of people aligned and, and paid um, to go accomplish the bigger mission of the company. Now, you've been critical of other companies for going beyond their mission statements and doing, for instance, politics. But if it is the case that other values stand above the mission statement in any case in every company, what's wrong with that? Why can't that be part of their meta mission statement? Hmm. I mean, I think I think every company could do that on their own. So I, I don't have any issue with other companies choosing to do that. They might actually clarify that in their mission statement, which is that their mission is to serve the ultimate human good or something more broad, right? Which could include um, activism or politics or something like that. Um, in our case, you know, I, my, my view was that the, the mission, um, which was to create an open financial system for the world, that might involve interacting with governments in the sense of um, if we need to go lobby for cryptocurrency policy or something like that. Um, but it didn't involve necessarily trying to solve every problem out there in the world. And so um, that was me basically saying, it feels like some of these companies are allowing th themselves to be distracted. And if you try to solve every problem in the world, you're actually going to end up solving none. And so there's real value and focus and solving one hard problem. Do you think companies are letting themselves become more distracted by politics today as opposed to 30 years ago? And if so, what has changed to cause that? Mm. Well, you know, I think you could look over history probably in different times, different places, different countries. There was um, various levels of this. I wouldn't propose, I, I wouldn't presume to look back 30 years, but I, I would say just in the last 10 years or so in Silicon Valley, it does feel like there's um, there's more focus on activism at companies. And so that was a change that I was noticing. But wh where'd that come from? Just out of the sky or people felt more guilty? They became too rich or the, the kinds of people working at the companies evolved? Um, you know, I'm not really sure what the origin of it was, to be honest. Others might have better thoughts on that. Um, I do know that, uh, well, I, I think one factor that might play a role there is that um, Silicon Valley, you know, was had so much fierce competition over talent that um, really companies were bending over backwards to kind of provide the, the most uh, accommodation to people in any way they could. And that came in the form of compensation, but also perks and um, you, you know, we were all really so scared of losing people because they all had, you know, they could go get three or four offers from another company tomorrow, kind of the, the top people. What's happened now is, you know, Silicon Valley has decentralized a little bit and started to be more remote first in their hiring. It's broadened the talent pool. And I think that has changed a little bit of that dynamic. Um, if, if the employees are really excited about, you know, taking the company a different direction, the, the, the management or the founders can kind of say, no, this company is about X and we're going to keep moving in that direction. So that's one factor, but there's probably many that are at play, I would say. Now, recently you cited an estimate that if Bitcoin were priced at $200,000, that about half the world's billionaires would be from crypto. How is that world different? What does it look like? How does it feel different from the world we have? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, I mean, I guess the most honest answer is I, I don't know for sure. Um, one thought I've had, though, is that if there are more people who generate a lot of wealth with crypto, which I think is it's already happening and it'll probably keep happening. Um, most of the people who bought crypto early on, they are they're believers in the power of technology to change the world. They're they're interested in the ethos of crypto in many cases. Um, and I suspect that they would allocate their capital towards more um, things in that vein. So you could almost have this, I don't know if you'd call it like a renaissance or a golden age or something of people who, who are, you know, tech, technology believers and um, they want to see a better future from coming from science and technology and they're going to use their capital for good in that direction. So that could be one outcome. Now, with some of your capital, you started something called givecrypto.org. 
Why do that instead of giving the money to existing charities? What's the advantage? Yeah, well, there's lots of good charities out there. In fact, some one of the ones that was Give Crypto was kind of inspired by was called GiveDirectly.org. Um, and the main thing that I didn't see anybody doing that I wanted to try with, with Give Crypto was the idea of uh, these direct cash transfers, but using cryptocurrency. And one of the things that cryptocurrency is good at is making global cross-border payments, especially in small amounts, uh, directly to the recipient. And sometimes there's um, you know fraud and there's middlemen. Like if you, if you wanted to say send hundred dollars to somebody in, in Venezuela, there's a lot of fees and, and issues where people might skim that along the way before it gets into the hands of the actual recipient. But crypto allows anybody with a smartphone to participate in the, the global crypto economy. And so it allowed us to do these kinds of experiments like sending um, direct cash transfers to people in those countries. Um, so that's, that's what I wanted to try with that. And it's, it's been going well and we've been uh, running some interesting experiments. If that can work, why isn't crypto more widely used for remittances? Western Union and other companies, as you know, they take out big fees. You don't get a great exchange rate, but there is a last mile problem. What's the reason to think that crypto can solve the last mile problem better than, say, money transfer offices? Yeah, so, um, well, I'm not sure it can. So, you know, crypto is great when you're doing crypto to crypto transactions, but to your point, if you need to convert, do a fiat conversion on one side, get it in crypto to crypto, and then a fiat conversion on the other side, you're going to encounter some fees there. Um, I can tell you in the case, for instance, of, of Give Crypto, we were able to see that you know over 90% of the people who received the crypto were actually able to find a local um, exchange place or merchant who accepted it. And so they were able to make that work, but they were people who were very highly motivated, right? Like um, there are situations where remittance corridors are more efficient and, and I guess crypto hasn't met the threshold where it's actually easier to use in those situations yet. But is the implication then that most philanthropy should flow to people who are very highly motivated because that would lower the cost of transfer? Mm, maybe. I mean, it's, I, don't, I like the idea of it flowing to people who are highly motivated. I'm not sure it would lower the cost of transfer in every situation because some of those markets are very inefficient as well. But um, yeah, maybe. How bullish or bearish are you about the future prospects of San Francisco and the Bay Area as a home for tech? Mm. Um, you know, short term bearish, I would say it, it seems like it's um, not in a great place right now. And there are a lot of um, talented people who are looking at other locations. Um, but I suspect long term, it will be OK. It's probably going to have a dip and a correction of some kind and um, have some sort of right revitalization. But the, yeah, short term, it's not doing so well. Now, I've seen estimates that about 20 percent of Bitcoin has been lost or people don't have their passwords or it's somehow abandoned or whatever. Let's say that 20 percent were found. Those people would be better off, right? They'd have more wealth. Who is then worse off? So I'm asking generally, what is the incidence of crypto? Is anyone else worse off? Is everyone else worse off? If I'd find a lot of paper money under my mattress while I'm better off, other people are equally worse off, right? Um, yeah, I suppose you have dilution, right? You have inflation if you're kind of increasing the money supply somehow like that. Yeah. But then if we ask the general question that the social value of Bitcoin, Bitcoin in general, again, clearly a benefit to the people who bought at low prices, they in essence found Bitcoin. But if someone else in the system is losing an equal amount, why think that the social value of Bitcoin is positive? Well, who's, who's losing the equivalent amount in this case, just so I understand? Well, I don't know exactly who, but someone else has less purchasing power, right? So Bitcoin isn't apples. You can't eat it for lunch. So if I find some Bitcoin, clearly I'm better off, but I'm commanding resources that would have gone to other people. And it's not clear where the efficiency gain arises that's giving someone somewhere in the system more apples. Mm. Well, um, it's not clear to me that Bitcoin is a zero sum game. I mean, something new of value has been created, which is that um, we now have a global decentralized um, store of value. And, you know, with other cryptocurrencies, of course, because it's not just about Bitcoin now, um, we have medium of exchange, we have security tokens, um, smart contracts. So this is actually driving a lot of innovation and, and um, new value, I would say. Uh, so, yeah, it's not clear to me it's zero sum. I think I think there's something inherently of value that probably made people net better off overall there. But what is that? Like, when do I get my apples, so to speak? Where do they come from? Um, well, I mean, anybody can participate, of course, right? So if you 
I'm not sure I'm answering your question super directly, but yeah, of course, anybody can participate in this global decentralized network and it's, um, it's there to benefit anybody who wants to use it. And I think now about probably 10% of Americans and maybe 60 or 70 million people globally have, have crypto. So at least it's been growing a lot. Here's a question from a reader and I quote, cryptocurrency fluctuates too much and too often to ever be a common medium of exchange. Why do you disagree? Unquote. That's for you. Yeah. Well, you have to realize that there's lots of different types of cryptocurrencies. So, um, you know, let's take Bitcoin, for instance. And, you know, some, some people use it as a medium of exchange. But as you pointed out, it's kind of volatile. So it's more often used as a store of value or an investment. And in, in, a, in an investment, volatility can be a feature, not a bug. You actually, when you buy it, you want the value of it to change. If it just stayed exactly the same forever, that would be a bad investment. Now, there's other cryptocurrencies that... Um, people are starting to use more as uh, mediums of exchange. You could look at stable coins, you could look at Ethereum, you could look at layer two solutions on top of Bitcoin, all these things. Um, so I think there's many different types of cryptocurrency. They'll fill different roles in the crypto economy. And that's why, by the way, I, I like using that word, the crypto economy, because it's it really is almost like a new alternative economy that's being built where people are not just um, trading Bitcoin, they're, some, they're earning a living, they're launching new startups, crypto startups, they're, you know, get borrowing and lending, they're doing all different types of economic activity, buying products and goods and services. Um, that part is still newer. Most people come into crypto and they just trade a little bit as their first experience. But that part is it's there and it's working and it's growing um, with things like DeFi and all the things we've seen in the last few years. When they stop making more Bitcoin, what will happen to the net fees for mining? What does that equilibrium look like? Mm. Or do you think it will fork and one branch of the fork, they just keep on making more, you know, Bitcoin new or whatever they call it? Oh, uh, well, I don't think it will fork at least no, nothing, nothing with substantial adoption. Um, there will only be 21 million Bitcoin and that's how it's how that's going to stay. I feel pretty confident about that. But, you know, the, so you t it depends what layer you're talking about. If you're talking about the base blockchain layer of Bitcoin, um, you know, we're probably not going to grow the capacity of that to do tons more transactions. And so it will only be used the, the base layer of the blockchain to, to move pretty large amounts infrequently that the transaction fees as more and more people use Bitcoin globally could go up there. But there's things called like layer two solutions, which um, would offer faster payments or there's other blockchains that are that are trying to target more that medium of exchange layer where fees could be very low forever. Um, and really focus on scalability. So it's kind of like the internet had to move from dial-up to broadband and, and enabled all these new applications. There's a lot of people working on the, you know, the broadband or the, the more scalable versions of blockchains that could enable that medium of exchange use case. But if we know the net mining fees are going up, shouldn't our prediction for the long-term equilibrium be one of very low velocity? And in some ways, the uses of Bitcoin will be more restricted than now and it will be quite inert. It will be there as a thing in portfolios but actually in a funny way, a little boring. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I, I think of Bitcoin as being kind of like digital gold. And so um, it's not, it may, it may turn out that it's not gonna be the medium of exchange, right? Unless those layer two solutions start to really work. Um, so if it's, if we don't get layer two, then I think Bitcoin will probably stay as kind of like a digital gold. And you're right, it will, it'll be large, slow moving amounts. It's kind of like the, the, the asset that people flee to in times of uncertainty. Um, almost like the reserve currency of, of the crypto economy. So um, I don't know if it's boring or not, but it may, you may see lower uh, you know, movement of money and that kind of thing. Why isn't it a Pareto improvement then to have a fork, to give up on the old agreement, have something called you know, Bitcoin new, where they do create more than 20 million, and that will keep the mining fees lower for Bitcoin new, and that will outcompete classic Bitcoin? Um, well, when you say the mining fees, do you mean the transaction fees, keeping those lower? Well, at some point, you won't be able to pay people with new Bitcoin to maintain the blockchain, right? Because the Q, the quantity, hits a ceiling. Right. What year has that happened? I forget. Oh, I mean, I think the last, it's a, it's a kind of asymptotic curve, but it's probably 80, 90, 100 years away or something like the, the very last one. I forget. Yeah. But I, you, I think your point is when, when the new Bitcoins being issued per block starts to decline, Transaction fees are how the miners were going to get paid. That's right. It. Yeah. And, and you're asking, um, why don't we make a new blockchain? Why not scrap? The, yeah, make a new blockchain, scrap the quantity limit on Bitcoin and allow the miners to keep on being paid with the creation of this new asset called it Bitcoin, Bitcoin new. Right. Well, so there are other uh, crypto assets that have different um, inflation curves, if you will. 
and they have made a, some of them have clarified that, some of them have left the door open to it, I, I should say. But Bitcoin um, and the community behind it feels very strongly that there should be a capped supply. Um, and I think it really is emulating gold in that regard that they're not going to, you know, unless we start mining asteroids or something, <laughs> they, they're not going to find more supply. Um, and they, the people behind it feel that that's important to have, um, I guess, a, you know, deflationary asset. And uh, it's one of the components in this new crypto economy. It's is it the one that people are going to use? I guess the market will tell us. What's the best model we have for how to think about the value of Bitcoin? The value of it. Um, <laughs> you know, there's so many uh, people sort of tie themselves into knots trying to think about like, what is the intrinsic value of it? Um, what, do you, what are you actually able to do? You know, you could think of it hypothetically as like, it's almost like uh, when you're spending minor fees or transaction fees, it's like giving you right access to this global decentralized ledger or something Like people come up with all these ideas. But I think, you know, the simple answer there is there's probably not really like a true intrinsic value to Bitcoin. It's, it's valuable because um, people think it's valuable and uh, it's, it has some use cases. Um, it's useful for some things. After the Ether 2.0 rollout, what will I be able to do that I can't do right now? What will that do for me? Yeah, so Ethereum 2.0 um, does offer a few things. I think one of them is um, scalability is probably one of the most important and underrated things. Um, so today, as I mentioned, the, the transaction fees are a little bit high, right? And it's kind of like that dial up going to broadband for the internet. Um, whenever you sort of lower the friction of something, it, it, it kind of adds all these new use cases. And so um, just to give you a specific example, today people in, in DeFi, they're doing borrowing and lending marketplaces. Uh, but borrowing and lending is something you do relatively infrequently. So, you know, you might actually have to write something to the blockchain if you were to, if you were to do a borrow or pay it back. But something, if you can imagine recreating like Twitter or something like that on um, the Ethereum blockchain, the you'd have to write to the blockchain every time you tweet or every time you, you know, heart something or make some kind of an action like that. And so you can imagine the number of actions per second would be, you know, hundreds of millions probably, right, at a certain scale. So... To get to eventually some kind of a scalability like that, um, we're going to have to have applications like Ethereum 2 um, go out there. And, you know, that's one example is the scalability. There's other things that could be improved along the way there in terms of um, privacy and, and usability. So, you know, an example is today when you're sending to Ethereum and Ethereum, you're sending to another Ethereum address. And it looks like this random string of characters. Um, you, you could say it's a machine readable address. Um, but, you know, there can be this thing we, we call it decentralized identity that would allow you to send it to a kind of human readable name. So in, instead of going to an IP address, you go to Google.com. Well, in this case, you would instead of sending to a random Ethereum address, you could send it to, um, you know, Tyler at Tyler.coin or something like that. But is there reason to think there's currently a large suppressed demand for microtransactions? If the main transactions costs to those are psychological, and now I can do it sort of easily. I don't have to pull out my Visa card. Uh, I just connect through platforms built on, you know, on top of Ethereum. W what am I going to use that for? I can tweet now for free. W where do I get my apples again, so to speak? <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I really understand the question. Can, can you repeat it? The new transactions that will be enabled by Ethereum 2.0, what exactly will I do with those? So I understand if I have this suppressed burning desire to make micropayments, like to read people's articles and pay them a fraction of a cent, that this new platform might help me do that. But I'm not sure I have such a demand. Uh, what else can the platform do for me? Or do you think the demand to make micropayments is really very strong? Yeah, so I mean, I don't think there's anybody who's sitting around saying, God, I wish I could make more microtransactions. I agree with that. Um, but I think whenever you give developers and entrepreneurs new tools, they tend to create new apps and they try to take advantage of that medium and, and do something new. It's, you know, it's, a, it's just like the early days of the Internet. A lot of people looked at it and they said um, there's some kind of blinking text or there's a, you know, a video of a of a cat or something like this is a toy. Why, why would we ever use this? Why would people ever spend their time on it? And that's not real. And of course, over time, people made new things that took advantage of that medium that people really resonated with. Um, or you could say the same thing about smartphones or the same thing about movies, you know, versus the theater. Um, when, when movies first came out, they were kind of just like filming what, what might happen in the theater, but they had to take advantage of that medium and do something new. So 
Um, I think the same thing is happening here with crypto and that scalability is just one of those new tools that it's really hard to say what could come out of it, but I, I do believe people will be creative and come up with new stuff. Now, as you know, central banks have started talking about doing electronic reserve currencies. China might be the first to do, to do this. Sweden and Singapore have at least raised the idea. Do you view that as a competitor to crypto or something crypto can somehow build upon or work with, a complement mm. to crypto? Yeah, so I think I think of central bank digital currencies as primarily complementary to, to crypto. Um, on the one hand, you know, it's a great sort of endorsement of this technology that central banks are starting to look at it. And, uh, and they're showing that there, there's things that they want to go build with it. Um, on the other hand, to me, the thing that's more exciting is, uh, is really these decentralized cryptocurrencies, because um, if we want to use centralized or fiat you know, currencies, um, we can do that today. And sure, blockchain might be able to improve some of the efficiencies around that, like interbank settlement or um, maybe foreign exchange or something like that. But and by the way, China is, I think, very far ahead on this with the digitized yuan. Um, but the more exciting thing for the world is kind of to have um, this, this global decentralized currencies. It's kind of like if, you know, the, a country came out with their own private Internet. I'm more interested in the global decentralized Internet. I think that unlocked more innovation. But if I could access an electronic reserve currency, again, black and gray market aside, that I understand. Why, for instance, would I want to use a stable coin when I have some other system of direct digital transfer that I can just do? Yeah, so stable coins are an interesting discussion. Um, there are some use cases where they really make sense today. For instance, people are trying to make, um, you know, they're making decentralized exchanges and, and various things where you want to have these currency trading pairs and you want to make something that's dollar or euro or, or yen denominated. And so it makes sense to have a crypto asset that is one to one linked with um, a fiat token underneath. I will say in addition to that, there's a lot of people who um, you know, they live in countries where they don't have stable currency. Maybe they want to have a dollar and, and they can't open a dollar denominated bank account, for instance, but they do, they can, they do have a smartphone so they can have a um, USD coin, you know, denominated account on their smartphone. So there's use cases like that. But I, but I agree with you. I think longer term, the more interesting thing are those decentralized um, crypto assets for people to really start to participate in a more global, more free, more fair economy. And that might sound like a very niche thing today. And, um, you know, but I think over time it'll become bigger and more important. What will happen with the Facebook asset formerly known as Libra, now called Deem, <laughs> which I think is a bad name, but I still think of it as Libra. Oh, okay. Why do you so think they rolled it out? Why like Deem? It confuses D I E M and D E E M, and it looks like a Vietnamese word, and Libra I thought was fine. Oh, okay. And it doesn't evoke anything. The yeah. name of your company, Coinbase, it's a great name, right? It base, solid coin, money, evokes notions of banking and payments and transfer and, and funds management. But yeah. Deem, what do you think of? You think of like some obscure general in the, the Vietnamese war in the late 1950s. Uh, I think of it like per diem or something like your daily payment you'd get. But, um, but by the way, naming things, it turns out to be incredibly hard just because of global, you know, trademark issues and all these things. And I'm... You know, it's so hard to find unused names that are good. But um, but what do I think will become of it? So, um, you know, look, I, I give them a lot of credit for being forward thinking on um, on this. They're of the big fang tech companies. Um, Facebook was really one of the first to go embrace this technology in a big way and see some of the potential of it. And they've taken their own approach to it, which now, of course, is not run by Facebook. It's it's this bigger organization. Um, of course, they, they managed to upset everybody in D.C. pretty much by doing it, which um, I didn't think was totally fair. Uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, China, I think, is pretty far ahead in digitizing the yuan. Uh, they've been working on this for maybe six or more years. They have this thing working and there's people actually using it. And um, in the U.S., we don't have necessarily state controlled things. We, we try to rely on the private industry to innovate. And in, that, in my mind, that was Facebook trying at least, whether they were going to succeed or not, who knows, but they were trying to kind of innovate there and do something that would help America and, and globally. Um, the, U, the US government had a pretty negative reaction to it, I think, because it was Facebook. But then once they realized that they were maybe potentially a little behind China, the US Treasury started to think about, all right, what is our solution going to be? And they're now kind of looking for that, I think. And I, I hope that they continue to make progress on that, whether they use USD coin or DM, or they create something entirely new themselves, because 
it would it would be unfortunate to see um, the yuan, you know, from a global perspective, maybe who knows if it would be bad, but from a U.S. point of view, it, it, it would be bad to see um, the U.S. lose its, you know, reserve currency status or something like that over a, a, a miss in technology adoption. Who is Satoshi? <laughs> Um, Give so, us your best guess. Yeah, my best guess. Obviously, I don't know who, who it is, and it's, it's definitely not me. But um, there's my guess is that there was a handful of people who came together to work on that. And there might have been one or two. Um, there, there's some good candidates out there, you know, Hal Finney and people like that. Um, my guess is it was a collection of people that some of the early cypherpunks and they one or more of them wrote it and they decided they wanted it to stay totally disconnected from them. Now, in all of these conversations, we have a segment in the middle, overrated versus underrated. Are yeah. you ready? These are I'm the ready. easy questions. First one, city of Houston, underrated or overrated? Um, underrated, I think. Um, you're asking because I went to school there at Rice. And, um, you know, Houston's a pretty great place. It's The weather's not great, but I it, it has an amazing economy. It has great people, great culture, great food. And um, a lot of really important industries and, you know, NASA and healthcare and oil and stuff like that. It's and it's yeah, it's a really cool place. Monty Python, overrated or underrated? <laughs> um, I think Monty Python is pretty funny, but it's I think that's a widely held view. So I, it's <laughs> I don't I don't know. It's probably a little underrated or something. The movie director, Ridley Scott. Mm. You know, Alien was such a breakthrough film. Um that it's hard to ever, and, and I think Blade Runner, right? Correct. Yeah, I mean, those are just incredible films that changed so many people's lives, and I, I think those are, will forever be underrated. But I, some of the more recent films, I just, I've really struggled. I'm not sure what's different. I, In fact, if I ever meet Ridley Scott for some reason, I kind of want to ask them, what was the process behind, say, Prometheus versus some of those earlier films? Because it feels like something materially is different now. Chinchulines, the food from Argentina. Chinchulinas. I don't know, think I know what that is. Oh, they're they're kind of disgusting. They're from the intestines of the cow. Oh, okay. I think. It's like, and they serve them in Buenos Aires. The, it's like tripe and that kind of thing. Okay. I. It means something very specific, but I couldn't tell you what. <laughs> I probably never tried it, so I couldn't say. <laughs> that must mean it's underrated then, right? <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. What is the biggest obstacle to charter cities in today's world? Hmm. Well... Yeah, I mean, I'm interested in charter cities. I think one of the biggest obstacles, of course, is that all of the land is claimed by a sovereign. Um, so it's hard to get one that's truly independent of, um, I guess, the, the legal system around it. Although I know there are people trying that, like for, there's one called Prospera in Honduras that seems to have gotten an exception from the government for this area of land to run its own legal system and, and court system. Um, there's some people doing really interesting work here in terms of uh, trying to bring people together in the cloud, so to speak, initially, because that's unclaimed land, so to speak. You, you basically got to do seasteading or go to Mars. Or it's probably easier to get people together in VR in, or on a Zoom call, at least, and then get in the cloud, this community. And then once you have some kind of critical mass happening and you might be able to go do collective bargaining and, and negotiate with a sovereign to get a little piece of land. But that feels like the, the hard part to me. What was the best part about living in Buenos Aires? Um, you know, the best part was that I got to see a country that had gone through um, hyperinflation, which might sound weird to say is the best part. But what it ended up doing was it, it helped me really understand uh, the potential for cryptocurrency later when I read the, the Satoshi white paper. Um, it really going having a country that went through hyperinflation like that, it affected really every part of the culture. Um, you know, just in terms of like people's optimism about the future, sometimes it, it I think it, it really harmed that it's almost like, live today to the fullest because, you know, tomorrow it might all be gone. It was almost like a this feeling that ha had lived under underneath that. And only the richest people who were able to buy um, assets that were that adjusted for inflation, like real estate, um, they were able to survive through these periods or to get their assets outside of Argentina. And so um, it really that inflation was so insidious because, you know, it eroded the wealth of the poorest people who held their wealth in cash. Um, so anyway, just seeing that was obviously tragic, but it led me to understand um, and appreciate uh, the potential for cryptocurrency more broadly. Let's say we had the potential to settle Mars. We had the technology and 5,000 people would go. What principles would we use for choosing which people and what kinds of rules or governance structure should they live under? 
let's say it's more or less self-sustaining when they get there. Solar power works. There's some other source of energy. Uh, they're not completely dependent on us. And they're going to make their own way. 5,000 people. Do they all come from one country? Is it all young people, a lot of old people? How do you do it? Yeah, well, this my first reaction is, like, why don't we let the market decide? You know, who, who wants to buy a ticket? Who wants to go there? Um, the market's good at, as you've written about, you know, in other contexts and <laughs> vaccines and all kinds of things. The market is good at sending information, transmitting it through the, through prices. So I, I like the idea of, of letting the market decide. In terms of what r governance system they would live under, I mean, I think there's some really interesting ideas about how to make the next version of democracy because, you know, democracy was such a breakthrough, but it has some, you know, issues that are cropping up here and there that people are thinking about how to improve on it. You know, for instance, um, we sort of have this accumulation of laws in the U.S., right? And people make these analogies to like tech debt in software. And um, like I think I think the IRS or the, the tax legal code is like 150,000 pages or something at this point. It kind of it only grows. And so one interesting idea for democracies, right, is that um, you kind of put like a sunset clause in every law where after four or eight or 10 years or something, it's sort of unless people actively go to reinitiate it, it, it sort of sunsets and goes away. Um, I also think, you know, yeah, it might be interesting to have um, other ways to keep the amount of uh, bureaucracy and overhead kind of low, like, uh, you know, it takes two thirds to add a new law, but it takes 50, only 50% 50 or less to remove a law. Um, I also think that a lot of laws, like they have these issues where people, they, you know, they want to add in all these additional um, special special interest things to get the votes to get it approved. And so you get these laws that are like thousands of pages and they have all these kind of special interests inserted. But if you, if you had a, some rule that was like, you know, every law should only be two pages maximum, otherwise it can't be a law you know, you'd kind of break it down into these smaller chunks that would be actually the law itself and not these massive things that people didn't read before they voted on. So I don't know. I'm not an expert on this, but there's lots of ideas about how we could probably um, iterate on democracy and Mars might be an opportunity to do that. If you could do one thing to accelerate progress in science, what would it be? Mm. Well, you know, I've thought about this a lot because I, I think it should become more like open source software, basically. And there, there's a lot of pieces that go into that. Um, there's a project I've been working on called uh, Research Hub, which is trying to help with this problem. Um, there's all kinds of issues in science around, you know, reproducibility and, and funding. And um, why aren't there more, you know, scientific scientific research that translates into um, products that can be commercialized, right? There's sort of, I think there's this huge divide between um, academia and scientists and entrepreneurs. And most entrepreneurs are starting companies that don't have any kind of scientific innovation behind it at all. It's purely marketing or they're making some new beverage or clothing line or something like that. And then most scientists are completely disconnected from business too. And sometimes, you know, they'll try to leave academia to start a business, but they're, it's not what they're schooled in. And so I want to try to help bring that divide together and some, create some kind of a prioritization mechanism that's like, if, if you're the scientist who, you know, discovers CRISPR or something like that, and a bunch of entrepreneurs can um, license that and go commercialize it in various ways, like, you know, that scientist should, they should be a billionaire from that. Like, those are the incredible breakthroughs that are really improving the world and um, improving people's lives, or at least have the potential to. So... Anyway, I, we have some first attempts at that uh, research hub, but it's a, it's a much bigger problem to try to make science and, and engineering more efficient. If genetic engineering of our children truly were possible, would parents choose to have too many or too few autistic children? <laughs> hmm. You know, I think a lot of people are worried about this idea that um, something like autism is a great example. Like, you know, it has some drawbacks, but it has some incredible benefits. And will people choose to just move away from these things. Um, but the, the thing that they're not contemplating, I think, is that there's such great variety in human preferences and people have a desire for um, uniqueness too. It's almost like you see these um, avatars in video games, right? And when when you can dress up your avatar however you want, um, you know, it gets boring to be the stereotypical, you know, tall or whatever kind of attribute you'd want to name. And so people start to come up with the crazy wild things. And so... Um, I guess just to get back to your question, I think that I, I don't I don't think it'll be too many or too few. It's like the people who are really interested in that might opt to move more in that direction. The people who aren't will move in other directions and we'll just have more creativity and variety. 
Now, the sector that Coinbase works in, in the longer run, what will the regulation of that sector look like? Will you be regulated like clearinghouses, like banks, like commodity brokerages? How is that going to be? Hmm. Well, so, of course, crypto is really touching many different industries and they'll each be regulated a little bit differently. Right. So there will be um, custodians for crypto that are that are regulated like trust companies or, or banks. And there will be brokerages for crypto that are regulated like brokerages. There'll be um, exchanges that need to have, you know, an ATS license. Um, there'll be even payments and remittance companies. Um, there will also, by the way, there'll be some that are just not regulated like traditional financial services. They're just like software companies. So for instance, if you're creating what's called a self-hosted wallet, which means you, the company, never take possession of customer funds, but you're just enabling people to store their own crypto and use it. Those, I think, will be regulated more like um, like software companies, which allows them to you know move quicker and launch in every country um, on day one and, and, and a lot of benefits like that. So, you know, crypto is really touching many different industries and they'll each be regulated uh, differently. But should those wallets themselves then be regulated like banks and say forced to have capital requirements? Because I could hold the wallet, I could make loans, I could do something that would be a bit like taking deposits. I could be transforming relatively illiquid assets into fairly liquid demand liabilities and we recreate the problem of runs. What should regulators do about that, if anything? Yeah. So, you know, if, you, if you're talking about a crypto company that's actually storing um, customer funds and then, you know, the next question you have to ask is, um, do they have kind of a reserve ratio or are they, you know, like, are they storing 100 percent of those assets or have they lent out a bunch of them and doing kind of more what so obviously if you're in a if you're in a world of fractional reserve then you would probably be regulated like a bank um, if you are storing 100 percent of customer assets and you're not um, in any kind of fractional reserve then you might be regulated more like um, a money transmitter or or someone like that so you know it's, uh, this is one of these fascinating things where whenever you're trying to create something new um, in a regulated industry which is where a lot of the opportunities are for entrepreneurs um, you know, you always go to the regulators and they're like, we have a box for this, one for this and one for this. And you come in and you're like, mine's kind of like none of those boxes. It's should we make a new one or do we check the one that's kind of closest? And that's always um, most people in the world are not as excited as entrepreneurs to try to make the new box. And so um, you kind of sometimes have to there's such an art to this. I actually feel like half the innovation we do is on technology and the other half we do is on regulatory compliance and policy and things like that. Just trying to explain it's not quite like any of those boxes and work with them to come up with a solution. Do you worry then, though, about regulation becoming countercyclical? So say you <clears throat> issue some liabilities and you hold a bunch of assets. When the value of assets is high, it's like 100% reserves. Something bad happens to the economy. The value of the assets falls. You're now not really 100% reserves anymore. So they come in and they regulate you more strictly and then the value of your own enterprise falls, and then the problem becomes worse and the regulations have to keep on becoming worse. Um, yeah, so I, I do think that as the crypto markets evolve, um, the regulation around it will also evolve. And for, in fact, we're seeing, you know, history repeats itself, or, but it, it, what, is that, what is that phrase? Like it repeats, but doesn't, it rhymes, but it doesn't, anyway, I'm forgetting exactly. <laughs> but, um, some of the regulation is happening, like those traditional market structures we saw in financial services are in some ways being replicated in crypto, but in some ways it's new. Um, we're seeing things like decentralized finance, um, decentralized exchanges that are, um, they, they can't really be regulated like the traditional way because they're they're running on some global decentralized computer. There's no centralized entity to it. Um, so I, I think in some ways it'll look the same, in some ways it'll it'll have to evolve and look new. I was speaking to someone uh, online a few nights ago, and I suggested that maybe the crypto companies that make the most money will be those that learn how to work with regulated banks and to merge their products into that highly regulated structure. Agree or disagree? Um, I disagree. But, the re you know, Bology would tell you the opposite, right? The future is going to be some kind of radically decentralized setup that the regulators won't even be able to get at. <laughs> Well, so I, I disagree that it'll integrating with the traditional banks would be the, the best way to go forward. And, and the reason is that um, 
traditional banks are notoriously slow at adopting new technology. And, and that's because they are so heavily regulated. I think, you know, you could almost say they're like quasi government institutions, even in the United States, um, that their decision making at the, the top levels, the board and the, the CEOs and everything is it's largely about um, how do we not get on the bad side of the regulators? It's, it's almost like a risk function is like the, the mindset at the very top. And I know that that's probably not entirely true throughout their entire organization. Many of them are trying to become more like tech companies, but I think it's hard to deny that banks are no, very slow at adopting um, new technology. So I think what's more likely is you're going to see um, new companies like like Coinbase, right? It's, it's, it's almost like, um, I don't know what's the analogy, like the traditional uh, newspapers when the internet came along, there were very few newspapers that successfully made the transition to being online, right? You saw um, social media and search engines, basically like tech forward things that succeeded in that arena because jumping across that chasm was almost like too much of a divide. Are stable coins mostly about regulatory arbitrage because they're less regulated than banks, but if they were regulated at the same level, why would I want a stable coin rather than a traditional bank account? Yeah, that's true. I think if you needed to go through all of the um, overhead to open a, an account to store stable coins, then it, it would lose a lot of the value. Um, I agree with that. I think what's part of what's innovative about stable coins is that um, with a self custody wallet, you can be anywhere in the world, just have a smartphone and, and open an account in a few minutes. That's that's a big deal. There's a lot of people in the world who wish they could open a bank account, but they're unbanked, they're underbanked, you know, all these kinds of words. Where do you think the changing regulatory landscape is headed? So if you think about the Bank Company Holding Act of 1987, among other things, it creates a certain separation between banks and commerce. Insofar as fintech and banks either work together or use each other's ideas, that seems to break down the traditional separation between banking and commerce. Uh, that in turn gets the FDIC worried about the values of which assets they're actually protecting. What's the long run regulatory equilibrium there? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. That might be a little above my pay grade. Um, I don't, do you have but a it's the world you it's the world you'll be living in, right? Yeah. Arguably, pretty soon. So how Coinbase positions itself? Imagine there will be some larger superstructure that tries to regulate everything in some way. That's what I would expect. It will be very hard for them to do that. But if stable coins become larger, say, as plausibly they might, at some point, banks yelp. Community banks seem to be very good at winning political battles. Banks in general always get bailed out when they need to. Crypto politically is very decentralized, and it's a lot of, you might call them unusual outsiders who don't necessarily have political clout, even if they have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So if crypto on average loses those battles, and the Fed, FDIC, and other regulators try to bring you all under the same umbrella, I would think personally that's the future and that actually Coinbase is fairly well positioned for that precisely because you have fewer problems with the regulators. But that's what I think about when I think about the future of your sector, what yeah, that so political equilibrium will look like. I think it's true that um, companies like Coinbase could be pulled into that those regulatory frameworks more and more especially if you look at the piece of our business where we actually are storing um, customer assets and, and looking more like, you know, at least a money transmitter, if not a bank longer term. Um, of course, I should mention parent, the parent company Coinbase has different subs. And one of those is um, a self custody wallet, which is it's regulated more like a software company than, than a financial service company because it never takes custody of any customer funds. And of course, there's many other crypto companies who are following that model. And so I think those will, I, I don't really see a world where those would be treated like banks. Um, that would have to be a massive redefinition of what it means to be a bank because you have to take deposits as, you know, and, and those companies are not really taking deposits in any sense of the word that I can think of. Um, so those I, I think would operate in a new regulatory environment. And that's where you're probably going to see a big unlock of innovation. Um, you know, that this is like one of these trends of history, right? Is like whenever you see something like software or the internet or whatever that's operating out of a, outside of a massive uh, regulatory oversight, you see this kind of flourishing of innovation. And so um, I think you'll see that with the self-custody aspect of crypto as well. Now, our final segment is about what I call the Brian Armstrong production function. And here there is no room for modesty whatsoever. So Coinbase has been a big success. What exactly is it about you 
that made that possible. So yes, you're smart or you worked hard or seven other things, but what's actually the unusual side of you that accounts for the success of Coinbase relative to your competitors? Hmm. Well, let's see. So there's there's one aspect um, that I think was important, which was um, I don't have the same risk aversion, I think, as some people. It's not it's not like I'm um, I, I'm actually not very risk loving in the rest of my life. I don't really like, you know, do base jumping or any any extreme sports or anything like that. But I also I've never really understood this. Um, when I when I read the Bitcoin white paper, I thought about it for a few years and I said, hey, maybe there'd be something like a cool company that'd be built in this space that would help people use this. And in my view, I was like, why don't I go try this? This sounds really cool. I'm interested in it. But most people, for whatever reason, um, don't do that. It's a kind of one of those entrepreneurial um, skill sets. So that's number one, I would say, is just maybe some kind of risk aversion or willing to try something new, even if I'm the only one who thought it was interesting in my friend circle. The second might be um, determination and just kind of being relentless. There, there is something about that where, um, you know, I, I'm kind of, uh, you know, uncharacteristically um, determined. I just, I, there's, building a startup is kind of like moving from one setback to the next with enthusiasm. And, you know, you get, you get sued by various people, you know, the employees quit, like you're almost out of money. Um, you get, there's cybersecurity risks and like, just one, you know, people have all these kind of people issues and fighting and um, there's sort of just nonstop issues. And so I've just always been very determined. Um, you know, having a little bit of a chip on your shoulder, I think helps, by the way, with that. Uh, people who want to go build new things, it's, it helps to kind of um, have something you need to go prove to the world. And I think there was a part of me, maybe as like a shy, introverted kid who always felt like, you know what, I have cool ideas, but I'm not very articulate. And people don't want to listen to me. I got to go show the world I can do something cool. And I thought it, I thought it would be fun. So, um, yeah, those are those are a few ideas. I'm sure there's lots more we could talk about in terms of um, how I prioritize my day or focus and, and those kind of things, too. But, yeah, those are a few ideas. What's your greatest interpersonal skill? What's my greatest interpersonal skill? Um, you know, I think I've done a pretty good job of hiring good people um, and it's so I guess that's more of like an assessment skill of um, understanding if I would work well with them and if they're, um, you know, if they're good at their job across a, diff a number of different disciplines. Um, I, I don't I don't think I was always the most I'll tell you one I was not very good at. I don't think I'm the most um, inspiring or compelling person. Um, you know, I've gotten a lot of practice at it over the years, but in, in terms of the early days, especially of Coinbase, in terms of fundraising and um, pitching people and recruiting. And I was never very good at that. I, I was, I was kind of like B or B minus. I was enough to get to the next stage, but, um, never, I never ended up being world-class at that. What do you hope to learn from composing electronic music? <laughs> well, um, you know, I always love learning new things. It's, uh, it's kind of one of those things I'm addicted to that's, that's just fun. And so that, that's something I've been trying out recently is trying to learn how, um, some of these uh, electronic music composition apps work and uh, meeting some other artists who use it and getting some lessons from them has just been kind of a fun way to decompress on the weekend. So that's my scratching my learning itch. How do you overcome CEO loneliness? <laughs> uh, what is CEO loneliness? I guess maybe, yeah. Well, the people you work with clearly typically are your friends, but there's a certain kind of distance that they're not quite in every way like the other friends you have. But yet, if you're determined and you're in some ways a workaholic, you're spending an awful lot of time with the people you work with. And that often breeds something that's been called CEO loneliness. Yeah. You can't confide to them about every worry or trouble in the business, for instance, that you might have. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the relationship with somebody you work with can be very, build great friendships, but it's, you're right, it is a little different if you're their boss. I think the answer for me is that I've made friends with other founders and CEOs. Um, some of my best friends are people that, uh, you know, in fact, I, one of the things that's really helped me kind of stay sane over the years is I've built this, um, group of friends that's, you know, it's about 10 friends. We get together about once a month and go on a trip once a year. And, um, they've all founded different companies and, um, they're, most of them are CEOs of it, but it's, that's been a great friend group. And we all learn from each other, various challenges we're each facing in our own companies. I think, but I think, by the way, maybe everybody should have a group like that. Um, 
of friends that you invest in. I, I think it's been great. And last question, what is it you hope to learn over the course of the next year? Um, I mean, one thing I think is that as crypto keeps getting bigger and bigger, there's going to be more and more um, scrutiny and attention on us from um, a government relations policy point of view. So I'm, I'm learning how to uh, build out a policy function. I'm also learning how to build out our marketing function. Um, to date, we have uh, gotten to where we are largely based on just organic growth and people telling their friends and, thing, and things like that. Um, and I think we're at a stage now where if we really get good at marketing and branding and everything like that, we can even just throw fuel on the fire. And so I, I was never somebody who naturally understood marketing, but I'm, I'm getting kind of a crash course and talking to a lot of people in the process of interviewing folks. Brian Armstrong, thank you very much. Thank you, Tyler.